Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the recording of the week nine lecture. Um, so, this is PSY 4050 Quantitative Research Methods. We're now into week nine, so the fifth session. And this week, I'm covering linear regression. Or regression, simple linear regression analysis. Okay, so the aims this week of the what we're covering is to describe linear models, so outline what they are so you understand them, outline the rationale for regression analysis uh, to assess relationships between two variables. So we're just looking at one IV and one DV this week. In the next session, when we go into multiple regression, we'll look at slightly more complex designs than that. Uh, we're going to explain the regression equation and the hypotheses that are being tested and learn how to interpret the output of regression analysis. Okay, so learning outcomes after this week's lecture and lab class, you should be able to explain the least squares regression line and how it's derived, assess the uh, influence of extreme scores on regression lines, run linear regression analysis in SPSS, interpret the results of a simple linear regression model. Okay. So, we're talking about relationships between variables again. So last week, we, in the last session, we looked at relationships between variables and we looked at relationships between continuous variables where neither is defined as an independent variable or a dependent variable. Uh, and we use correlation to do that. In this session, we're gonna cover regression analysis, which looks to see if there is a linear relationship between two continuous variables where one is defined as the IV, the independent variable, and the other is defined as the DV, or dependent variable. And you can see I put on this slide on uh, next to IV, X ver axis variable. So that's usually the variable that's plotted on the X axis. And for the DV, for the dependent variable, for the Y axis variable, we'll say some more about that in a second. But you can use this, this type of analysis to address two specific two particular questions. Firstly, is there an association between the two variables we're looking at? And secondly, can scores on the X variable, the independent variable, be used to predict or estimates what scores should be on the Y variable, the dependent variable? Okay, so let's start from the very beginning and talk about plotting relationships between variables. So, what do I mean by linear relationship? And what am I talking about when I say X and Y variable? So starting at the beginning, we can plot data for two variables, X and Y, uh, on a set of axes, like the ones shown uh, on this slide. And so these are what are known as Cartesian coordinates. Um, I've just shown positive X and positive Y axes there. They could continue in the negative direction on the X axis and downwards in the... Uh, negative direction on the y-axis as well. That's what the, the Cartesian plane usually looks like, but we're just focusing on one quarter of it. So when you have positive scores on an x and a y variable. Yeah. So the horizontal axis, as you can see, is the x-axis. I've labeled it x. The vertical axis is the y-axis. And the x-axis is used to plot the independent variable or the predictor, or, or we could also call it the input variable. And the y-axis, is what we use for the dependent variable or the outcome variable. So given scores for an independent variable uh, X and a dependent variable Y, we can plot them as coordinate points on this particular Cartesian plane. Okay, so you can see that here, what I've got is uh, that same little bit of made up data set where there's certain scores for each case, observation, or participant on the X and Y variable. And I've plotted them on those X, Y coordinates on those, uh, as I've plotted them as, as X, Y coordinates on that Cartesian plane. Okay, uh, and so for example, hopefully this is clear. If we look at the first, the first row of our data table there, you can see the value of X is one, the value of Y is one. And if you look, um, if you look here, We've plotted x, plotted the value of x as 1, the value of y is also 1 at the same time. If we look at the second one, when, when the value of x is 2, if we 
for this particular observation, the value of y was 3, so 2 on the x-axis, and the score was 3 on the y-axis. So you can plot these as pairs of points, essentially. One point um, relating to a score on the x and y-axis. Okay, hopefully that's straightforward. You can see, if you look at the others, you see they match up correspondingly. Okay, so general linear models. The basis of general linear models in statistics is to describe the pattern in a set of data using a straight line. Okay, um, so you in in school you might you might have done this in certain subjects disciplines, and it, it was called something like uh, the best fit line, sort of drawing the best fit line through the data. Uh, we can see here, despite there being spread. Uh, the data being spread out. Um, there's a general trend in this in this data uh, of points going uh, up and to the right. So as scores increase on the x-axis, scores generally seem to increase on the y-axis as well. And this is the basis of linear modeling in statistics. So what we do is we look at the data and we, we can fit a straight line through the data that captures the pattern of that data. Uh, and the, this is what's meant by linear. So linear basically means describing in, uh, describing the pattern in the data using a straight line. So putting a straight line through the data set. Okay. So as you can see, I've fitted a, a, a straight line through this, a best fit line through this data set. And it sort of captures what seems to be the overall trend, despite some spread around uh, of the points being scattered around that line. So it's a model for what we think the data is doing, essentially. So why use a straight line? So straight lines are easily defined using a mathematical function in the form of, of an equation. Uh, and that function returns scores on the y variable, the dependent variable, based on input of scores on the x variable, in our case, the independent variable. OK, and mathematically, it's worth noting that the behavior of straight lines is well understood. If you have a straight line, it kind of keeps going in a straight line. <laughs> Whatever angle it's pointing at, you can you can kind of keep drawing it on and on infinitely in one direction or the other. OK, so the equation for a straight line looks like the one shown on this slide, uh, which, which says y equals mx plus b. And when it's written in this in this way, it's called sloped slope intercept form. OK, so this is a this is a basic equation from uh, geometry and algebra. Uh, and that that is probably the most common form in which you see the equation for a straight line. OK, so let's unpack this a little bit. The equation for a straight line consists of a number of components. It consists of y, which is a score on the y-axis, and that score on the y-axis, whatever whatever a uh, observation score for a particular in our data set for our participants is on the y-axis, that is a function of m, which is the slope of the line calculated by uh, delta y over delta x is what it says on this slide. So this little triangle and then a y over another triangle and x. That's the Greek character delta, and that's a common way you will see um, you will see the slope of a line um, represented. And it basically just means change in y divided by change in x. So what we mean here is how much does uh, if we look at that particular line that's drawn on there, on the on the particular on this um, this chart, how much does uh, a, the line go up on the y-axis every time it goes up one unit uh, on the x-axis? Okay. Um, so the slope of the line m is multiplied by x. As you can see, m and x are next to each other in this equation. And x is a score on the x variable. OK, so we input a score on the x variable. Uh, we multiply it by this, the slope of the line. And we do something else as well. Um, we add 
B, which is the value of Y when X is equal to zero. OK, and that's known as the intercept. It's most commonly known as the intercept. It's sometimes referred to as the constant. It's worth knowing that uh, they're the same thing. SPSS refers to it as the constant. OK, so that, so breaking our breaking down our our equation there, what we can see is a score on the y variable is a function of the slope of the line times whatever value it is you put on the in into the x-axis plus uh, the intercept plus b, which is kind of like a bias term. If I use, hopefully you guys can see my cursor. So this is the intercept. It's where the where the line crosses the y-axis when when the value of x is zero. So x is zero at this point, and the line is the the intercept here is is maybe just a little bit more than 0 0.5. If you look there, it's just kind of about 0 0.5. So that's the intercept in this particular case. All right, let's talk about this a little bit more. So hopefully this graphic makes things clearer. It sort of it illustrates what I was just saying in a bit more detail. So M is the slope of the line and that's the change in Y divided by the change in X. And you can see by those orange hash lines there on the slide. So if, if say this orange line in X, uh, if X goes up one, how much does Y go up? Maybe 0 0.5. So Delta Y would be 0 0.5 divided by Delta X. If we, if we used one unit of X, we put one in the bottom half of that fraction of that division. Um, OK, um, B is the value of Y when X is zero. I've kind of highlighted that there with the arrow. So this is B, the intercept. And once we know M and B for any corresponding X value we put into the equation, it will tell us the Y value that's predicted by the straight line model of the pattern in our data. OK, so we could once we fitted this model, this this line as a model, if we wanted to now, what does the model predict for an X value of three? We'd look at three, go up to the line and then read across. It suggests it's probably roughly about it would predict a Y if you've got an X value of three, a Y value of roughly about three. OK, so. This raises an important question, where is the best place for the line? So where and how do we fit the straight line so that it's in the best place uh, to capture the pattern in the data? OK, what we use here is something called the method of least squares. OK, or least squares reg regression. So re regression uses the equation for a straight line. But it rearranges it slightly and um, different characters are used by convention for the slope and the in intercept just to make things confusing and you will most commonly see the the regression equation the slope the the equation for a straight line written as it is on the bottom of this slide rather than seeing it in slope intercept form y equals mx plus b what you'll see is y equals alpha plus beta times x okay so it's not too confusing i don't think if we if we arrange the slope intercept form equation for a straight line as we can see below here we get the regression equation and these two equations are equivalent so all you if you look at the top equation that's slope intercept form and all i've done is put the b the intercept before the mx previously it was y equals mx plus b now it's y equals b plus mx so addition is commutative it doesn't matter which order you do it in so that doesn't affect the equation in any significant way equation underneath is the same thing but using the characters most commonly you will see when it's when people are doing regression and that's y equals alpha plus beta times x and as you can see alpha in this case is the character that's used to represent the intercept or the constant and beta is used to represent the slope of the line okay so
here are the two terms highlighted again on this slightly different scatter plot okay so our alpha and beta uh, are often also written you'll see them written as lowercase a and lowercase b it means the same thing so alpha is here the intercept the value of y when x is zero and beta is the slope of the line which as we know is calculated by working out how much the line goes up on the y-axis by every every unit it goes uh, up on the x-axis okay so least squares you will sometimes see the regression equation written like this uh, so y equals alpha plus beta x plus epsilon so this little e character there and epsilon is a term that captures the fact that there's error around the line fitted to the data so it's it's you might see it occasionally see it in that, uh, referred to as irreducible error um, the error term epsilon is often left out of the regression equation we usually just see y equals alpha plus beta x and the fact that there's error around the line is just taken for granted so if you see it written like this or if you see it written like it was on that previous slide there uh, means the same thing there's nothing to worry about in particular all right so the line that we fitted our linear model is a biased and imperfect model of our data it doesn't pass through every point perfectly if they're all lined up in a perfectly perfectly straight kind of line even if it's at an angle of some sort uh, then it would be a perfect model of the data but data tends to be messy certainly in psychology and disciplines like that um, there's so you get variability around the line so the line uh, is a model but it's an imperfect model as you know, uh, a lot of st statistics involves quantifying variability and error spread around data. Uh, and that's what we do when conducting a regression analysis. So the regression, the regression line modeling the patterns in our data using a straight line is an imperfect but, but useful model. Uh, the more linear the relationship between our variables, the better it is as a model for predicting scores on Y using an X variable. Okay. So residuals or errors, the errors in regression, that's how much the points vary around the, uh, the line we've fitted are called residuals. Uh, so these are hopefully, as you can see from this slide, the difference between the value of Y that is predict, predicted by the line, uh, which here is on this particular slide is, is labeled as Y, and it's got like this little hat on top of it. You might hear it referred to as Y hat, it's all Y carré, basically. Okay, the actual data point for Y, uh, for the value of Y for a given data point, um, may differ from the line so we've got an actual y here and we've got the predicted y so we've got we've got some residual error here we're predicting y should be this value based on the line but we've actually the actual value of y for a data point in our data set is below the line so we've got a lower value of y uh, so the distance between the actual data point and the y value that's been predicted by the line is the residual or error okay so the regression line y equals alpha plus beta x uh, is calculated so that it goes through the mean of both variable x and variable y and minimizes the sum of squared errors or minimizes the sum of squared residuals okay so this should be familiar in a lot of ways because we're uh, based on the formula for variance we've covered in previously weeks uh, and you can see that here we've got um, the sigma notation which uh, as you know means sum and then after it we've got y minus y carré 
uh, in brackets, in parentheses, and that's squared. Okay, so what that's telling us to do is to get our sum of squares, which you know is a, is a, a single value, we take each y data point, each actual point, and we subtract it from the predicted value of y by the line, which gives us our residual, how much error there is between the line and our actual data points. And then we square it. And obviously you guys will remember when we square it, we're getting rid of the negative and positive values that sit either side of the line, which would cancel each other out. And then we sum together, we sum up all of our data points with the residuals for all of our data points, get the sum of, sum of squares. Uh, and it's, this is known, the regression is known, line is known, it's known as least squares regression because we're taking the square of these residuals and we're putting the line in a place such as it gives us the smallest uh, amount of sum of squared error that we can find, okay. So, sum of squares, a little bit more on that. This slide illustrates sum of squares. So, how, note that as some of the points have negative deviations and some have positive, uh, we have to square them before summing them. Otherwise, they just cancel each other out, similar to how, we, how, how things work with the variance formula. Uh, and we, as I just said in, in, on that previous slide, uh, we are going to put the line in such a place that the sum of square, the value for the sum of squares is the smallest. Okay, right, so the steps for fitting the line. Uh, as I said, the criterion of least squares is used to fit the regression line. And this involves fitting the line such as the sum of squared ver vertical deviations of the data point from the line are minimised. Okay, the main steps are calculating the mean of X and the mean of Y. Uh, then that coordinate point, uh, the line goes through, essentially. And then we pivot the line around that mean, uh, mean X mean, Y mean coordinate point until you find, uh, until you, you put the line in such a place that um, it gives us the smallest sum of squares. So we keep tilting it, we keep tilting the line, we reach a point where we've got a small sum of squares and if we kept moving it, the sum of squares would start increasing again. So there's one point at which we'll get a, we will get the, a minimum uh, amount of error we could possibly get where, wherever we put this line on the graph. And some variability will be left and that's the redu irreducible error. Okay, so not all data points are going to fit perfectly on the, on the line. By minimising the sum of squares, we've brought all those points as close to the line as we can make them. And any, any other line will have a higher sum of squares. So software such as SPSS works out where to put the line for you. OK, so which intercept to use and which slope minimises the sum of squares. You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to. Stick, draw a line on the paper, work out the sum of squares, draw another one, work out the sum of squares. So you don't have to iteratively try out lots of different lines, work out the sum of squares until you find the right one that fits, uh, that minimizes the sum of squares, yeah. So with linear regression, where you've got one independent variable and one dependent variable, there is actually an analytic solution. There is an equation that you can use to find the slope of the line, um, but for multiple regression, I don't think that is the case. I think that you, the computer has to do a similar process to what I've just described of iteratively fitting lines and then working out which, which position gives you the smallest sum of squares. Okay, so let's move on. So he's just at this point, I, I included this plot just uh, to show you kind of just to illustrate we've got our x y axis you've got a data set we've got a line fitted on it and we've worked out what the mean score for y is and that's that line drawn across from the uh, uh, horizontally from the y axis and we've worked out what the mean score for x is that's the vertical line going up and touching the line and that point there that coordinate point where x of the mean of x the mean of y 
is whether we, we pivot the line around that until we put it in such a place that we can't make the sum of squares any smaller. Okay, so that's, that's basically it uh, for how, how regression works. It's fitting lines to data. Let's talk a little bit now about the SPSS output for regression. So the essence of the analysis in uh, it can really be summarized in two tables, but SPSS gives you three tables. And the third one, I put it third, it's the model summary table, it can be useful as well. Um, so the three tables that we're interested in looking at when we run a regression analysis and look at what the results are, are an ANOVA table, a coefficients table and a model summary table. So starting with the ANOVA table, uh, this tests the hypothesis of whether the slope of the line is significantly different from zero. OK, and the hypothesis being tested here is is does fitting the line, the, uh, the, the regression line, provide a better model from the data than just using the mean value of y. So if you look here on this on this little uh, uh, diagram that I've drawn, this little plot, uh, the orange dashed line there is y, y bar, y mean, so the mean y value of y, and that's a completely flat line, yeah, so it has a slope of zero, okay, and what the ANOVA test is doing is, it's testing to see whether the slope of our regression line is significantly different to zero, and if it is statistically significantly different to zero, um, uh, then we could argue that, or, or what we're what we're claiming is that it provides a better model for the pattern in the data than just trying to describe the data using the mean value of the y variable. Okay. So, and you can see that. So I I, I copied this table from some SPSS results here. It is the ANOVA table. You guys are familiar with these by now. And you can see you've got an F value of 73.342 and a significance of P is less than 0 0.001. So it's highly significant. OK, so the test that's been done here is an ANOVA test. You comparing two, two things, essentially two groups. Uh, the mean, uh, the, the slope of the line, the, the line for the mean of Y, zero against the slope of the line for our regression line and if they're significantly different we get a significant ANOVA result and if they are statistically significant it tells us something interesting which I will come to on, on to in a sec so the second table is the coefficients table okay and and that gives us our best estimate of the intercept and the slope okay so as you know we've got beta is the slope of the line alpha is the value is the intercept or constant the value of y when x is zero okay and for this if you look at the spss output next to this particular plot the, the data doesn't relate to this output table i'm just using it for illustrative purposes the first column here has a capital b and it's it's titled unstandardized coefficients and if we look at the unstandardized coefficients and this B column, what we see is the first row, we've got the constant or the intercept. It gives us a value of 3.79. So what that is telling us in this case is the, the running this analysis on the data that was used, um, the estimate, the best estimate for the intercept is a, is a value. So the point at which the line crosses uh, the, the Y axis when X is zero is a value of 3.79. And the second row there, it's called, it's called stressful life events. So it was a, it's it's it is the it is the independent variable that was used in this particular analysis. As I said before, it doesn't relate to the data in this plot, but it gives us a value for in the B column of 0 0.00, 0, 0, sorry, 0 0.011. Okay, that's the slope. That's beta. So if we're looking at our equation. Alpha is 3.79 and beta is 0 0.011. Okay, so what that's telling us is essentially um, every time the x axis in this particular data set goes up by one unit, whatever it's measured on, 
then um, the y-axis increases by about a tenth of a unit or you like about 10 percent of a unit whatever that was measured on okay so our 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 regression equation for this particular for this particular an an over, uh, sorry regression output here in the coefficients table would look like y equals 3.79 plus 0 0.011 times x yeah so we can use that information to make interpolations about the value of y for a given x that's not necessarily in our data set so once we know know what the intercept is and we know what the slope of the line is we could pick values of x that we haven't actually got in our data set such as 4.5 and we could use the line to predict what the y value would be based on our model our regression model okay so the other thing of note in this coefficients table if you look at the last two columns uh, you've got a t and a significance so you've got a t value a t test and a significance uh, and what this what's happening here is the, the t test uh, tells you whether x is a significant predictor of y okay so what we're seeing here is that for this particular data set it was the dv was mental health symptoms and the iv was stressful life events and what it's telling us here we've got a t value of t equals 8.56 p is less than less than 0.001 so we've got a significant t test result there and that's telling us that um stressful life events is a significant predictor of mental health symptoms on this particular data set okay so uh, an important thing to note here is when we're doing linear regression we've only got one independent variable and we've only got one dependent variable so previously with our ANOVA table we found that that was significant so it was telling us it gave us a significant ANOVA result which told us that our model was significantly better than just using the mean which which tells us that whatever our independent variable is must be the fact that the ANOVA result was significant tells us that whatever our independent variable was uh, on this simple linear regression model then the independent variable must be a significant predictor of the dependent variable so it's no surprise that the t value is significant as well it took me a while to kind of figure this out because it's telling you the same information really on a linear regression model you've got a significant f value it's telling you your models are significant your models better than using the mean so you're you're going to find that your your iv is a significant predictor of the dv x is a significant predictor of y and then we've got this a t a different test used to test the same thing really it's telling us that our independent variable in this case stressful life events is a significant of mental health significant predictor of mental health symptoms okay so why why do we need that information twice using two slightly different tests well when you do multiple regression and you've got more than one independent variable so we could have three or four or five different independent variables so we could have stressful life events um, age uh, nutrition could be any number of things as additional independent variables and they could be predictors of uh, they they could all be predictors potential predictors of mental health symptoms and what this coefficient table coefficients table does it would have all of them listed in this case we've only got one so we've only got one shown on there but you'd have all your other independent variables listed and you'd be able to see which ones were significant so we this one would be significant but it's not necessarily the case that your other independent variables you've put into the model are so the t-test and the coefficients table are kind of more useful to us when um, uh, when we have a multiple regression model uh, for a linear model like this it kind of fit it, it took me a long time to kind of figure out why why we need that information twice uh, but that's the reason why okay so the third table that I mentioned is the model summary table uh, not all software gives you this output 
but it is quite it is quite, kind of quite good that SPSS gives you this. Uh, so this third table, the model summary table, it provides us with some measures of effect size, and it does that by using correlation. Uh, so R and R squared, and adjusted R squared in this case. Uh, as you guys know from when we cover correlation, correlation is a measure of effect size. Here we are, we are using a mid linear model. The most useful one really is R squared. So it gives us a measure of how much variability in the data set is explained by fitting the regression line. So for R squared on this particular table, this relates to the previous. So the output, the, the SPSS output there, the ANOVA table, the coefficients table, the model summary, they're all from the same output. And what this tells us is you can read R squared as a percentage. It tells us that about 13.7 or nearly 14% uh, of the variability in scores on Y are explained by scores on the X variable. So it's a, it's a significant model, you can use it, but there's kind of a lot of error. It's telling us that about 14% of the scores in, in the variability in, in scores on Y are accounted for explained by the scores on the X variable. Okay, adjusted R squared is, um, a more, a, a more strict, a stricter, uh, more stringent kind of test that adjusts, um, it, it adjusts the degrees of freedom, makes the test a bit, a bit stricter. Uh, and you'd use that in certain, in certain circumstances, really. Um, but in this case, for this particular data, we could use, just use R squared. There's not a great deal of difference between the output for the two. They're th both around 30.5% is the amount of variance explained by fitting this model. Okay, last thing I'm gonna cover is standardized regression coefficients. So the on that coefficients table, there was a column I didn't really mention, which is the standardized coefficients table labeled beta, and I've highlighted it in red on this bit of SPSS output. So the slope of the line beta is known as the regression coefficient. Uh, and what it means is for each one unit increase in X, as I said, Y increases by whatever uh, the slope is amount. So y, so each time X goes up, if we look at our unstandardized coefficients, each time X goes up by one, the Y value increases based on our line by about 0, 0.01 or about, um, sorry, it's, a bit, it's less than that, it's about like a hundredth of a percent, something like that. Okay, so... Um, hard to interpret what that means. So, if if our variables are measured in very different units, uh, they could be measured on very different scales. So, stressful life events could have been uh, measured on a scale of one to a hundred, and mental health symptoms symptoms could have been measured on a scale of not to five or something like that. So. You know, you know it, the difference in scales of measurement between different types of variables can vary, vary quite vastly, you know. Uh, and you end up, you know, comparing hundreds of thousands of something with tens of something. Okay, so a way around this is to standardise the coefficients. And it gives us a way of more meaningfully interpreting what the output means. So if scores on both variables are standardised, i.e. converted to z-scores, uh, and the regression lines calculated on these standardized scores, then the regression coefficient is known as uh, known as beta and referred to as a standardized regression coefficient. It's known as beta on, if you look at the column highlighted in red on this output, it says beta, it says standardized coefficients above it. On SPSS output, that's kind of how it's represented. What this tells us, which makes it more much easier to interpret, is that a, every time the value of the x variable increases by one standard deviation, this leads to an increase of about 0.37 standard deviations on the y variable. So each one standard deviation increase in scores on, on x leads to about nearly a 0 0.4, 0 0.37 increase in scores on y. Okay, so it makes it much easier for us to interpret the size of the effect. And sometimes, you know, depending on scales of measure, if you've got multiple uh, predictor variables, multiple independent variables there, you could have a unstandardized beta coefficient that's quite large, 
but when you look at the actual standardized coefficients um, the amount the amount of influence it has on the model is quite small okay so i'm going to stop there i've only put one reference on this one it's the uh, the most recent version of andy field's textbook the 2018 version um chapter nine covers regression i think it's sort of in uh, general linear model uh, regression it's a good way to start he covers uh, linear regression and i think he goes on to cover multiple regression in the same chapter um, we've just focused on linear regression this week simple the simplest version of this type of analysis um, where we've got one independent variable one dependent variable okay uh, in a couple of weeks time we'll move on and we'll consider multiple regression where we've got multiple independent variables and one dependent variable and we'll look at the way they combine um, which which of our independent variables are good predictors of the dependent variable uh, but this is it's important to understand the, found, the foundational concepts with regression regression analysis so linear regression like this and for categorical stuff logistic regression are probably the two most uh, sorry linear regression multiple regression for continuous variables like this and logistic regression for categorical output outcomes Probably the two, two most commonly used types of statistical analysis in the world. They're, they are very important, so it's good to have an understanding of them. And this linear model that we've been talking about here today, using straight lines to, uh, to model the pattern in data, is the basis for all the other, um, all the other parametric statistical tests that we've been talking about. Okay, right, I'm, so, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, hopefully that was interesting and useful and um, I'll see you in class. Okay, bye.